One of the things I learned in my careers, my careers as starting as an entrepreneur when I was 18 years old and moving into code a few years later and doing all kinds of different things. Most of my career though has been very code centric, but I always looked at coding and programming as a tool in my tool bag. So I would develop apps and I would develop SaaSes and businesses that are centered around code. Sometimes the original Studio Web was actually a web development studio where I had a team of work, people working for me and we're developing websites and web apps for people. And then, uh, well now Studio Web is a SaaS that schools use, it's educational SaaS. And I've had other pieces of software that I've utilized to support not necessarily technology businesses, but the technology was used to support these other businesses. That's why I got into coding in the first place was to create a presence for myself on the web I had actually one of the first websites in the world that were, uh, well, I had one of the very first websites in the world. I had one of the very first websites in the world that had photos on it, believe it or not. And I was able to open, open up markets in Europe and Asia because of my website in the 1990s. Back in those days, if you put up a, a good photo of a fish, a colorful fish, you were like a web god. Because in those days, optimizing images and putting them online, that was like... Uh, it was black magic voodoo back, voodoo back then. Anyhow, things have changed. So one of the things that I benefited from was pushing into other areas where I wasn't comfortable. Now, as a general principle, I like to play to my strengths, but it's good to expose yourself to different things. So for instance, I actually come from more or less a designer background. I was... Uh, uh, graphic design, trained in that, and uh, the artistic end of things, if you will. But I decided that learning to code was such a key skill set for my business because I would be able to express all kinds of ideas much more easily and quickly if I knew how to code. So I pushed myself to learn how to code. And let me tell you, back then, the resources uh, weren't very good in terms of learning how to code. So it was a lot harder than it is today. And especially when you come from an artistic background like I did, it was difficult for me, but I really pushed through. And one thing I can tell you from that is that it's been invaluable for me to jump into that arena to do something I wasn't comfortable with and it exposed myself to that. Even if you don't end up becoming a coder full time, understanding the basics of it is such an important tool to have because it, be, it will allow you to evaluate things more clearly. Case in point cryptocurrencies, bitcoins. If you are a software developer, you're going to have a much deeper understanding what cryptocurrencies are, what these network are, and what it all means much more than somebody who doesn't know anything about coding. And so you, it will allow you to make much more informed decisions about cryptocurrencies, allow you to be able to look at them with a trained eye to be able to assess which currencies, which of the crypto coins might be the better uh, investments investments in quote, meaning gambling. But nonetheless, it could be a lot of money be, to made with them, but you gotta look at the underlying infrastructure. Just being able to buy and sell cryptos is a pain in the butt. And for non-coders, like, it could be a nightmare for them. Although, although these days you can go to Coinbase and Coin.io. But again, with my major mess up with Bitcoins, even though I'm, I'm a software developer, it was a real pain. But, and, I, and I didn't end up buying them seven years ago because I just, I just got lazy. I was at the third stage of the process. And that was a big mistake, of course. But that being said, I was able to do it because I had a background in coding. It gave me that opportunity, whereas a non-coder, very much more difficult for them. And even today, much more difficult. So what I've done, I've, uh, with one of my partners, we bought miners and uh, LTC binders. And it's not that we think we're going to get rich on these things, uh, quite the opposite. It was more or less an, an experiment. We're checking into it, kind of, you know, we wanted to get miners, try it out, uh, get on top of that thing, and just, 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 to, just to see what it's like as uh, nerds. And then, op then by using it and working with it, even though it's not something we're necessarily really focused on or something we really, uh, it's not our main thing by, by any means, not even close, but I wanted to explore that for real 
get my hands dirty for real with mining, with owning the coins, getting the wallets, this and that, doing the transactions, working, just so we understand it. Because understanding that space might reveal business opportunities. Forget about the gambling, you know, the gambling on the coins, that's one thing, but there's also all kinds of business opportunities that might come out of that. And I'll close with this. I remember when, I don't remember, but I'm not that old. During the California gold rush, during the Cal- California gold rush, very similar to the cryptocurrency gold rush, uh, well, the, crypto- the cryptocurrency rush, back during the California gold rush, all these people were going to California because they thought they could get rich mining gold because said, there's, a lot, there, there's gold in them hills in California. So everybody was going to California to mine gold. Mm. What history has taught us is that most of the people mining the gold didn't make any money. But the people who made the most money in the California gold rush were the people providing the tools and the services for the gold miners. The guys selling the, the shovels and the picks and the wheelbarrows and all the other equipment that you need to mine gold. And so we bought a, a few miners from, uh, from these companies who produce LTC miners. And I was talking to my partner, I said, you know, these guys are making huge money. Like, they're back-ordered. I bet you they're making 80 cents on the dollar, if not 70 cents on the dollars, and they just can't make enough of these machines. These guys in China are making a fortune on supplying the miners to the, uh, all the people, all the suckers like me. And so my friend also built, uh, my partner also built some Ethereum miners. And again, it's uh, AMD with their GPUs. They can't keep up with the demand. It's incredible. They're making a ton of money on these Ethereum miners. Now, my, we might make money on these miners, but the problem with the mining of the uh, cryptocurrencies is that uh, difficulty, it's not exponential, but they increase quite quickly. So it's like our machines, ROI, return on investment, is like literally plummeting. Now, it depends if the coins keep going up in value or not, so it's like a race, right? We don't know what's going to happen. But I tell you what, the guy who's, who sold us the machines, uh, AMD, who sold the JP, GPUs, they made their money right away. <laughs> Boom. They're out. They're doing fantastic. So uh, keep that in mind if you're interested in the crypto space. I think the guys who are going to make most of the money are going to be the ones supplying the tools for the uh, people involved in the crypto space. It's hard to say, though. I'm sure, I'm sure you hear about those Bitcoin millionaires as well. There's no question about that. But uh, nonetheless, there's something to consider. History is a good teacher, by the way. History is a good teacher. I think it was a Mark Twain, very famous guy from the state, U.S. said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it tends to rhyme. Anyway, something to consider. Bye-bye.